Hello, everyone. Please let me know that you can hear me. Uh, I am your host, Caroline, and it's uh, 5 p.m. UK time today. So we are starting a bit earlier and we do have another topic to discuss. So as always, uh, it's good to be back with uh, someone you already know. I'm pretty sure. If not, this is Dr. Maria Arke. Hi, Dr. Maria. How are you feeling? Oh, Caroline, I'm good. I'm pretty good. Happy to be here as usual. Exactly. We are definitely happy that you have joined us once again, of course. It's always a pleasure to have you with us. And uh, well, you definitely brought a very interesting topic. Uh, but before that, as always, let me uh, thank to everyone for joining us already. But also I would like to thank our ambassadors and partners for their constant support we've been doing all the webinars from the very first of april with stronger together initiative and uh, of course as you can see there are more of those ambassadors and partners so thanks to them for joining thanks to them for their support and as i mentioned interesting topic that we have and dr maria has prepared so it's iv uh, ivf add-ons and r they worth it. So, of course, Dr. Maria will start with her presentation on this particular topic, and then it will be time for your questions. So, as always, please just type all the questions that you have in the chat section so that Dr. Maria can help you out with them. And, well, don't miss that opportunity to ask anything that comes to your mind as well. And, well, uh, that will be it from me at this point. So, Dr. Maria, are you ready to begin? Perfect. Thank you, Caroline, for your Excellent. kind introduction. So, as Caroline, as Caroline said, uh, the topic for today's webinar is IVF add-ons and if are, they are worth it or not. Um, so, just to introduce myself, I'm the medical editor at Forte International, as Caroline said, that's a clinic that is based here in Barcelona, Spain. And, um, so let's start with, with the topic that we wanted to, to discuss today. So what are IVF add-ons? So basically, IVF has revolutionized human reproduction by offering the hope of a family uh, for, for patients and for people that didn't have that option before. And there are many, many patients who are willing to try absolutely anything that might help them to improve their chances of having a baby. Uh, the HFEA, which is uh, one of the main authorities in the UK of embryology and reproductive medicine, defines the IVF add-ons as uh, optional extras that you might be offered on top of your normal fertility treatment, and often uh, those have an additional cost. So there are sometimes techniques that might have shown very promising results on animals or in the lab, or other, or other kind of techniques that have been around for a very long period of time, but that haven't necessarily been proven to improve the pregnancy or birth rates, or have any tangible benefits in terms of the health of the offspring. And in that sense, the main purpose for me to, to propose this topic for the webinar today is that for me, it is crucial that all patients are provided with relevant and reliable information clearly through the fertility treatment to make an informed decision about what's the treatment that they are going to go through and which of those add-ons might be interesting or might have a positive effect in their specific case. And what do we know about all those add-ons? So I, I've just divided the presentation into, into very big different groups of add-ons. One is the clinical adjuncts or add-ons, and the other one would be uh, the lab add-ons. Okay. When we speak about the clinical adjuncts, um, I used this uh, paper that was recently published at the Fertility and Sterility uh, magazine, which is one of the main in the field. And uh, in, in this uh, review, they have looked at some of the most used add-ons for fertility treatments, and they've uh, given them a score, like a traffic light, to see if they were proved to be effective if we didn't have that certainty, but that maybe they can have a positive effect or might help. And uh, those that we have some evidence data that probably they don't have a beneficial effect on, on the outcome. When we're speaking about outcomes here, 
we are speaking always about having a live birth or a baby born, which at the end of the day, it's the main goal or, or the main purpose of any fertility treatment, because sometimes there are some techniques that might improve the number of eggs or might improve the number of embryos, but that, that doesn't necessarily mean that this translates into having more likelihood of having a live birth, which is the important goal that we're looking at here. So from that clinical perspective at once, that's the summary of what was discussed in the paper. And the atoms that were discussed here were the screening hysteroscopy. And the evidence said that overall, uh, there is high quality evidence that showed that there is no benefit on performing a routine screening uh, with hysteroscopy in women undergoing IVF. Uh, it might be necessary or it might be indicated and maybe have a positive effect to, to do it for all those patients who have had what we call recurrent implantation failure or that we have um, a suspicion that they might have a uterine malformation or any kind of problem like that. But otherwise, um, it doesn't look like it has any positive effect or that it might increase the chances of of having a successful outcome. And when we speak about stimulation regimens, there's a lot of drugs that uh, are advertised all over the place that you might search them in Google or in some websites uh, regarding fertility and you might see a lot of very different information depending on what you're looking at. And when we look at the evidence and what we know, uh, this is kind of the, of the summary of what uh, has been studied. Uh, so basically, the AGA, which is a supplement that uh, it's sometimes used to improve the, the levels of androgens, and it's usually used for patients that have low ovarian reserve or that are poor responders, showed maybe a, po a possible beneficial effect in this in this kind of population. Okay, uh, most of the studies were using 75 milligrams of the AGA for around three months before. Uh, anyway, the evidence that we have so far is too inconsistent to draw a firm conclusion about that. And that's the reason why uh, it can be discussed with a poor, res with a poor responder patient to use it, but uh, also uh, making sure that the patient is aware that it's not proven clearly that it's going to have a, a positive effect. With testosterone, we have uh, similar, um, similar results, okay? Uh, it, ha it might have a, posit a possible beneficial effect in patients who have low testosterone levels and poor food responders, but the current evidence is, is inconsistent and we need randomized controlled trials um, to, to provide us with that evidence that we are seeking to, to be able to, to promote using those drugs in the case that they prove to be effective. The growth hormone uh, has been used in some patients as well, and we lack of, of strong evidence to support the use, uh, the use of the growth hormone um, as an adjuvant treatment for ART, except for very specific diseases or patients that might have some growth hormone defects or things like that. Um, aspirin is a drug that is widely used in, the, in, in treatment of, of IVF, and uh, <coughs> We don't have proven efficacy for the routine use of aspirin as an adjuvant for the treatment, especially if there is if there are no medical conditions that justify using that. Okay. The other thing is that the safety data remain limited in this field as well, and that the current evidence does not exclude the possibility of having adverse effects. It is it is true that the aspirin might might play a role, and it, it might be indicated for patients that might have a thrombophilia, or it is currently used in a lot of in a lot of uh, clinics as, as an empirical treatment for patients who have recurrent pregnancy loss and a lot of times for recurrent implantation failure. But when we speak about empirical treatment, what we're saying is that we are using this treatment because it maybe might have a possible beneficial effect because it worked in some patients, but we don't have the evidence, we don't have the data to, um, to be able to confirm that robustly. Okay. 
Regarding heparin, also, it, it may have a benefit, obviously, in patients that have recurrent implantation failure and thrombophilia, and the thrombophilia is identified, but it needs to be uh, very carefully considered when it's uh, recommended, and also balanced against the potential side effects and costs of having to use heparin along the, the whole cycle. Regarding antioxidants, both for male and um, and female, there has been a recent Cochrane reviews uh, that have uh, checked the data that is available. The main problem that we have with all this data is that the results are not conclusive or the evidence that we have is very low because most of those studies use different kinds of uh, supplements or, or mixes of supplements, so it is difficult whenever we see any kind of effect to uh, discern or to know exactly uh, which of the whole components that we're using is the one that is responsible for that effect. And uh, the evidence for using them for female uh, is that it doesn't look like it would have a very important positive effect, except for obviously having to use folic acid to uh, avoid any, any, <clears throat> any complications or problems related with neurotubal defects, and also in the case that we have uh, we have identified some specific deficiencies or insufficiencies in some vitamins, but in those cases, this needs to be supplemented. And antioxidants for males, especially for patients who might have alterations in the sperm, looks like it might increase the birth rate, okay? But the, the quality of evidence is low, and it looks like it might have a positive effect on the ultimate uh, result that we're looking for, that is the life birth rate. Regarding seminal plasma, which also has been used sometimes, um, it looks like there is no clear evidence for for using that would justify using that because it doesn't make any difference in the life birth rates. And the PRP, the platelet rich plasma, that was also um, considered for trying to improve the endometrial thickness, especially for patients who who had recurrent pregnancy loss, and there was a randomized control trial that showed an increase in the clinical pregnancy rates for these, these kind of patients. Uh, and it was also considered for trying to improve the ovarian reserve, but we don't have randomized control trials for, for that. And currently, the use of the therapy of the platelet rich plasma is only considered experimental and usually within, a, within the context of a study. Uh, otherwise, it's not a treatment that it's recommended. And those would be the, the, the clinical add-ons that I wanted to discuss today. And now we're going to start speaking about the add-ons that are um, done in the lab or that are related with the lab that, as, as most of you probably have seen, if you have already had experience in a fertility clinic, you will see that when you go to a fertility clinic, apart from the basic fertility clinic that might be recommended in your specific case, there are a, there's a huge list of other things that might be added to your treatment. And sometimes it can be uh, very difficult to know exactly uh, if those other um, added treatments might be useful in your case, if those might uh, increase your chances of having a live birth. And uh, that's what we're going to try to explain right now, what is the evidence that we have about all those add-ons. For this, I've used two different papers, one that was published in Human Reproduction. It's, uh, it's a paper with very good quality evidence, and then another one that has been recently published at Fertility Stability as well, that also used, uses that traffic light scoring. Uh, from the HFA that helps us see if those uh, treatments or that ons are going to help us increase life birth rates or not. So I'm going to start speaking about uh, hyaluronic acid and advanced compounds that are in, for some of you that probably you know it as embryo glue or, or other names that are similar to this. Uh, this is uh, the use of, of a specific uh, media that is uh, enriched with uh, acid hyaluronic with glycoprotein hyaluronic, and uh, it looks like maybe it could have uh, a potential beneficial effect in, in enhancing the process of uh, implantation and avoiding the explosion of the embryo. And, uh, and the hypothesis for that is that the hyaluronic acid is naturally present in the female reproductive tract. Uh, there has been a, a Cochrane review that 
uh, included 17 randomized controlled trials that showed moderate quality evidence for an improvement in clinical pregnancy rates and life birth rates using that medium and uh, also in association with an increased uh, risk of multiple pregnancy when, uh, when that medium was used, okay? And uh, so it looks like maybe this, uh, the, the use of the hyaluronic acid other compounds maybe could, could help with, uh, with implantation. But the, the level of evidence that we have for that um, it's again low and further randomized control trials are needed to evaluate the efficacy of the hyaluronic acid as an evidence component when we're doing an embryo transfer uh, for single embryo transfers and also uh, for the possibility of using the multiple pregnancy rate. Regarding sperm DNA fragmentation, as probably you know, uh, DNA fragmentation is a test that can be done on the sperm to check how damaged is the sperm of, of the um, how, how damaged is the DNA of the sperm, and depending on this, uh, decide if maybe there are some other techniques in the lab that could be implemented to try to maximize the chances of a pregnancy, or maybe uh, to justify the use of antioxidants before starting the treatment. These assays include different kinds of tests because in, in the, englobed in the, in the name of sperm DNA fragmentation, we have different kinds of tests like tunnel comets, CSDSA, CSDSA, and the 8-OHDG test. Uh, all those methods are, are different, as I'm saying, and they are used for assessing the sperm DNA integrity, but they do not reliably predict treatment outcomes and cannot be recommended to routinely for clinical use. This is one of the recommendations from the American Society of Reproductive Medicine regarding this test, at least not as something routine, routinely used for all patients. Uh, a recent program a review uh, checked uh, the antioxidant therapy in the male might increase clinical pregnancy rates and life rates in patients where these spermatozoa are suffering from oxidative stress. We know that if they have high oxidative stress, the sperm DNA fragmentation is going to be higher and then probably the likelihood of having a worse results is going to be higher as well. So it looks like in that case, it might be beneficial to use antioxidants for these patients, apart from obviously doing some important changes in their diet and uh, lifestyle habits to try to minimize the risk of being under, under the action of the oxidative stress. And again, uh, we need more randomized controlled trials to investigate the hypothesis that antioxidants can reverse the oxidative DNA damage and therefore uh, urgently needed to address this possibility. Now I also wanted to, to speak a little bit about time lapse. So time lapse that has other commercial names, um, it's taking pictures over time and reviewing them as a film, okay? Uh, in the field of reproductive medicine that was used for the first time by Messere and then Peterson, that uh, and what they have is that prediction models uh, using information from different finger cleavage timings and patterns. And that way they could make a score uh, to see which are the embryos that are more likely to implant and to give a live birth. The usefulness of the time lapse imaging in human IVF um, has been justified by, say, by explaining that there's, that means not missing any of those important events during the culture, having um, more quality control, uh, use, using that as teaching applications for embryologists and having more information to the patient and also maybe increase life birth rate. A Cochrane review done last year, 2019, showed insufficient good quality evidence of differences in the life birth rate or clinical pregnancy rate, discarded in stillbirth, or clinical pregnancy rate to, to, um, in patients uh, to choose between time lapse or with or without embryo selection software and conventional implantation. So but again, the, the summary or the conclusion here would be that we need more trials uh, to distinguish whether there are clinical benefits of embryo selection algorithms on time lapse information leading to increased life birth rate and whether those benefits uh, come from that 
or from the fact that we are not interrupting the culture of the embryo because when we're using time lapse, there is no need to take the embryos out of the incubators to assess them. The other add-on that I wanted to discuss here is the pre-implantation of genetic testing for aneuploidies, which um, the pre-implantation of genetic testing for aneuploidies, as, as most of you probably know, it's what we usually do with the embryos up to the stage of blastocyst, and at that stage we do a biopsy on the trophoderm on day five, and then we do the karyotype of, of the, the biopsy sample to check the embryo is euploid, it's chromosomically normal. And PGT has been actively marketed as, an as, as a technique to increase implantation rates and consequently decrease time to pregnancy, recurrent miscarriages, and repeated implantation failure, which all of those are true. And uh, the important thing here is that PGT has not shown to improve life birth rates overall. What does that mean? That your, your overall chances of having a successful life birth depend mainly on your quality and the sperm quality of your partner, or in that case, if you're using donors, also of the donors. And that's what's going to determine your likelihood of, of success out of that whole cycle. Having said that, if we do PGT, it's true that we are already selecting the embryos that are chromosomically normal, which means that we're going to have less embryos for transfer, and therefore, the time to pregnancy is going to be less because obviously those embryos have higher chances of implanting and giving you a life birth. The risk of miscarriage is going to be less as well for embryo transfer because obviously one of the main reasons why we miscarry is because the embryos have chromosomal abnormalities and obviously that's going to decrease the, the, the problems of implantation or implantation failure. There are a couple, um, apart from these, I wanted to mention and explain a couple of studies. One study was called STEAM, which is one of the, the most important studies that have been done uh, regarding PGT. And the pre implantation of genetic testing for chromosome abnormalities did not increase in the rates in IVF in that study. And there's another study that I'm going to show now that it's called STAR, that also shown a, um, a beneficial effect for for some specific population, but not for everyone. So overall, the benefits of PGT would be that it reduces the miscarriage rate and recurrent implantation failure, time to pregnancy, and the number of treatments. And the disadvantages would be the cost, that it's an invasive procedure. And again, it doesn't increase the overall chances of pregnancy out of the cycle. That's the STAR trial, that it's another one of the most important uh, trials that has been done uh, regarding PGT or PGS. And here, they were comparing uh, in different groups of population, so patients who were between 25 and 30, 40 years old, patients who were between 35 and 40, and then all patients together. And they were comparing patients who were having PGT or PGS and patients who were not having PGS and they were having elective single embryo transfer. And when they were looking at the pregnancy rates, there was a difference in the pregnancy rates um, for the group of population between 35 and 40, uh, being higher for patients who have done the PGS. But they, they didn't see a difference in the miscarriage rates, at least it was not, not significant for, for neither of the groups. So again, uh, not all patients will benefit from PGS. We have to also think about the risks, not only about the benefits, and it has to be individualized in which cases that might be beneficial. For example, for patients who might end up having, I don't know, some blastocysts out of a cycle, probably you want to do PGS because you don't want to be transferring 10 embryos because that would, would require a lot of time and a lot of money for the patients. And in that case, it would be important to reduce the time to pregnancy and to select better embryos that are worth being transferred. Or for a patient that has already had four miscarriages, in that case, it would be super important to try to minimize the risk of having another miscarriage. So in that case, it would also be probably indicated or beneficial to do the PGS, but not as something generalized for all patients. 
Then I also wanted to explain a little bit about the mitochondrial DNA load measurement, which is something that has also uh, been used a little bit. Uh, one of the things that was seen is that it has been estimated that metaphase 2 oocytes, so uh, oocytes that are mature, contain 105 mitochondrial DNA copies. But since there's no replication of the mitochondrial DNA uh, until the blastocyst stage of embryonic de development, those uh, mitochondrial DNA molecules are divided over the cleaving cells. And in 2015, there were two papers published reporting an association between higher mitochondrial DNA levels and lower implantation potentially in blastocysts, pointing out that maybe um, those all sites that have distorted uh, energy provision and metabolic stress in those embryos uh, might have higher mitochondrial DNA content. Okay. Currently, there is no evidence that selection through the mitochondrial DNA load measurement increases the life birth rate, and the application of this technique for the moment should uh, therefore strictly be limited to the participation or either in, in randomized control trials, or obviously, and this should uh, clearly be committed to the patient because we don't have that data yet to use it as something um, on a regular basis. Record, um, regarding assisted hatching, as uh, most of you probably know, assisted hatching is um, is a technique uh, with with the one that what we do is we make a, a bridge in the zona pellucida to help implantation. It is usually performed or in day three or five or six of the development, most of the times probably in day five. And clinics usually use assisted hatching for uh, patients that have advanced maternal age, smokers, or patients that have high FSH or when they are transferring embryos that have been uh, frozen. Okay, there are three meta analyses on assisted hatching that have found a significant increase in clinical pregnancy rate, but no evidence for a difference in life rate. Uh, Martins uh, published a, a paper in 2011 uh, where they found a significant difference in the clinical pregnancy rate using frozen embryos in unselected women and also uh, for patients with repeated idea failure, but no evidence of benefit for subgroups of either older women or those with good prognosis. Okay. And, uh, and the NICE guidelines, the uh, guidelines for uh, National Institute for Clinical Excellence states that assisted hatching is not recommended because it has not shown to, to improve pregnancy rates. And I also wanted to explain to you a little bit about artificial oocyte activation, because uh, I don't know if you've heard about this. So, one of the worst outcomes that we could have in an IVF or it's a cycle is to have what we call the total fertilization failure, which is obviously a devastating outcome to have no known of the eggs fertilized. And uh, the incidence of probability that this happens is around 3%. And one of the important risk factors for that would be global zoospermia. Uh, when we have fertilization failure, most of the times this is because there's a disruption in the normal sequence of molecular events, which occur usually during fertilization. And uh, obviously, all site activation is a critical step for that. Uh, there are different methods to artificially induce all site activation that have been proposed as a possible treatment for fertilization for fertilization failure. And systematic reviews of randomized control trials concluded that there is insufficient clinical evidence to recommend its use in practice. The process of oocyte activation is uh, thought to ultimately influence normal redevelopment, epigenetic imprinting, and pregnancy outcomes. And the HFEA states uh, that oocyte activation with calcium gyanophores may improve fertilization rates in XC cycles where failed fertilization has previously been observed. However, they acknowledge that there are no randomized control trials to demonstrate that it's effective or follow up studies on the safety of the technique. So, also for the moment, this remains uh, experimental. And then uh, I also wanted to explain or speak a little bit about what we call the advanced sperm selection techniques, which include all those techniques to select healthy, mature, and genetically normal sperm for fertilization in the expectation of trying uh, to improve the outcome of traditional IVF or ICSI treatment cycles. And this would include PIXI from one side and IMSI. With PIXI, what we would do is a co-incubation of the sperm with the acid 
to better identify the sperm uh, that are better uh, for ICSI. Sperm usually expresses the receptors to bind to the hyaluronic acid are the ones that have better morphology and motility, as well as lower rates of sperm DNA fragmentation and better chromatin structure. Um, nevertheless, there's a Cochrane review uh, that uh, checked what is the effect of pixie on the results of the cycles, and it showed little or no effect on live birth rate or clinical pregnancy rate, but it said that maybe it could reduce the risk of miscarriage. And on the other hand, there's IMSI, that uh, the difference between IMSI and ICSI is that uh, the motile sperm um, are examined under a very high magnification uh, microscope that helps to, to identify better all the organelle and the morphology inside the, inside the sperm. And uh, that way, what we would be doing is selecting better the sperm that has all the organelles and everything more normal inside. Uh, the disadvantage of using that technique would be that, obviously, uh, it requires much more time for the biologists to examine and select the spermatozoa. And regarding the risks faced by, by the patients and obviously the, the embryos that are going to be created with that would be exactly the same as for HC. And also the Cochrane review recently done about that showed no improvement in clinical pregnancy rates, life birth rates or miscarriage rates with IMSI compared with routine, with routine ICSI. So to conclude, uh, what I would like to say is that medical treatment and laboratory techniques are critical for the success of medically assisted reproductive cycles. And in the search for improvement in outcomes, many innovations have been introduced. But unfortunately, often uh, some of those innovations are introduced with little evidence of improved outcomes. Um, we need a great collaboration between clinicians and embryologists and patients to develop uh, research priorities with the intention of developing a rational approach to evaluate innovations that might lead to have better outcomes. We really need this. And then uh, one of the things that I would recommend for any patient who is about to undergo fertility treatment uh, is to uh, discuss or ask all those questions to, to their fertility specialists to better understand what they are going through and what is the impact of any of, any of those at the treatment on the outcomes, which um, that's, that's I, I took this from from an initiative that it's called uh, Choosing Wisely Campaign, which is, uh, I think that's very interesting, um, to, to try to help patients make more uh, informed uh, decisions and to empower more patients uh, in terms of, yeah, taking, taking a more proactive um, role when they are undergoing the treatment. And those are the questions that I would recommend to, to do. So do I really need this test, treatment or procedure? What are the risks that this test or this procedure involve? If there are any other options that are simpler or safer, what would happen if we don't do that technique? What are the costs of this technique? And how will this treatment affect my chances of a life birth? Which at the end of the day for me is the most important question. Which is the difference that this is gonna make on the, on the most important outcome of the cycle, which is a life birth? And I think that this is it. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your time and attention. I hope that you found um, all the content of the webinar interesting. And now I will be more than happy to address all your queries. Thanks. Excellent, Dr. Maria. Thank you so much for a very thorough uh, presentation. Lots of details, but definitely useful ones. Well, as always. So thank you so much once more for that. And yes, definitely it is time to start our Q&A session. And there are some questions ready here. So, well, let's get to them right now. And the very first question is right here as well. I was advised to do ERA tests sorry, <clears throat> after five unsuccessful IVFs and hysteroscopy. I'm doing egg donation program now. The doctor asked me to do ERA test. And when I went to the clinic, which performed this test, the doctor there was very skeptical about it. He said it costs a lot of money and doesn't help that much. My previous doctor told me the same. I'm very confused to do or not to do it. Mm. 
Hi, Julia. Uh, I know it, it is a very difficult situation whenever you're getting um, contradictory information from different doctors. I don't know your specific case, and I don't know if you're, uh, you're doing the treatment with, with your own ex or with the ex of an ex owner, or if there are any other added factors that might explain why your embryos did not implant before. Okay, I know you're doing a donation, sorry. Now, I don't know if the previous cycle were also with an egg donor or not, and, and if there are any other factors. Uh, the truth is that usually in most of the cases when we do the endometrial receptivity test, in more than 70, 75% of the cases, your endometrium is going to still be receptive. So probably it won't change anything. Okay, so probably the, the protocol that you will need to use with progesterone and everything is going to be exactly the same. Having said that, uh, after having had five uh, failed cycles, uh, if there is any kind of, um, of suspicion that maybe there can be an alteration in, in the receptivity of your endometrium, I think that it would be worth it to to make sure that there is no alterations there because obviously you have already spent a lot of time and money on fertility treatments and uh, probably having the reassurance that there are no alterations in the window of implantation, that's something that could add um, a little bit um, more clarity uh, on, on how your treatment's going. What I mean with that is imagine worst case scenario, hopefully that's not going to be the case, but if you do want that uh, the next embryo transfer and the embryo is not implant and you have not done the test, will you be regretting or will, will you be wondering if maybe your window of implantation was misplaced and maybe you should have had a different regime of progesterone? That's the only thing. But obviously, the as I'm saying, most of patients will have a normal window of implantation more than 70%. So I, I think it's I, I wish I had a more clear response to that, but it's not black or white, it's kind of a gray, but probably having gone through that very high number of attempts, I would, I would check uh, if there is anything out there. All right. Excellent. Thank you so much for your very first question. And of course, Dr. Maria, as always, for your um, advice on that as well. Um, next question is also ready. Uh, are you able to give details on embryo glue and embryo gen and what evidence suggests regarding success rates? Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what I explained about the, all, the, all those other compounds uh, that have this, uh, that, I, that contain uh, the hyaluronic acid, is that they, it looks like maybe they can have a beneficial effect on, on the likelihood of implantation, but that's not that clear. The evidence that we have is not that good. Having said that as well, there is a lot of media that, are, that don't have those names and that the labs already use by routine that already have the hyaluronic acid. So sometimes there is no need to pay for any extra money if the media that the, the lab is using already contains sim has similar content. Uh, I cannot, I wish I had the data specifically to give you the numbers, but there isn't. So I'm sorry that I cannot give you more clear information about that. And uh, obviously that this is one more add-on to the, to the treatment that may, might have a possible beneficial effect, but it's not that clear. Okay, again, thank you so much for your question and Dr. Maria for your mm -hmm. answer to that. Um, all right, so next question also is uh, ready. From your experience, which add-ons do you recommend? Wow. Hi, Nadine. Uh, thanks for your question. Uh, first of all, I would not recommend add-ons in general at all because uh, I don't think, I, I mean, I don't think that we can generalize in that case. I think that uh, it really depends on each case. Um, generally, I think that the most important thing is the core treatment that we're going to do for that patient. And having having said that, and knowing which is the prognosis and which is the specific case, then we can discuss if there are any add-ons that might be beneficial in their specific case, and which is the kind of benefit that those can have for, for each patient. But I cannot give a general recommendation for that. 
All right. Again, thank you so much for uh, this as well. Indeed, interesting question. <laughs> and uh, let's have a look. We do have a next one. So are there any benefits of taking DHEA when AMH is higher than average? I read it can't help with recurrent. I can help with recurrent miscarriage or is it just for poor responders? Mm -hmm. Hi, Stephanie. So as far as I'm concerned, VHA would only be indicated, or at least the data that we have, for patients who have low ovarian reserve. I, I am not aware of any, any um, reliable data uh, published in any of the, on the reliable papers of reproductive medicine stating that VHA can help with uh, recurrent miscarriage. So I would not recommend to take it for, for that purpose. All right. Again, thank you so much for the clarification to this one. Um, next one is right here. What are the potential benefits of adding aspirin to an IVF cycle? Yeah, that's a very good question. So basically, um, one of the main reasons why, why aspirin is added to cycles is in the context of patients that have had what we call recurrent pregnancy loss or recurrent miscarriages, or patients that might have thrombophilias, or even in patients that do not have thrombophilias that we already have done all the assessment of the what we call the screening of recurrent pregnancy loss and recurrent implantation failure, and uh, all the tests were normal, and then when you discuss the patients that maybe aspirin could play a role in helping them, even though it's what we call an empirical treatment, which means that we don't have the data to, to verify that it's going to have a positive effect. But from the clinical experience, what we're seeing is that sometimes in these kind of populations that might be helpful. All right, understood. Again, thank you so much. And actually, there is another question from Stephanie. Uh, what role does antioxidant sorry, have uh, in IVF cycle? Yeah, so basically, antioxidants are uh, supplements, uh, basically vitamins and minerals that help uh, to fight what we call the oxidative stress. Okay, the oxidative stress that we, our bodies are, are um, exposed to really depends on several different factors and some of the most important factors driving that would be our general stress and our lifestyle and uh, diet. So if you're having already a generally a very, a very healthy lifestyle and diet and still um, maybe some of the, your results are not as good, for example, the sperm quality not as good, probably you would be benefiting of taking antioxidants. Otherwise, um, I think that it's much more important to focus on changing the lifestyle habits. So for example, someone who smokes, uh, obviously if that person also takes antioxidants, that's going to help partially to cope with the oxidative stress they are exposed to. But it's going to be much more beneficial for them to, stop, to quit smoking rather than taking the supplements. But People smoking 20 cigarettes a day. What I'm trying to say with that is that a lot of times things can be much cheaper than what we think, and the solutions that we probably a lot of times want to hear are the ones that require more effort and commitment from us, which are changing our lifestyle and committing to having yeah, healthy diet, not smoking, not drinking, not drinking very occasionally, having a normal BMI, trying to cope uh, well with stress and having some some stress management tools like yoga, meditation, or whatever might work for you. Uh, yeah, avoid any processed foods, sugary drinks, and all those things. And that's probably going to have much better. And having, obviously, a very, uh, a very good um, sleep and rest, uh, those are the things that could help you better to cope with oxidative stress, better, much more than the antioxidants. Having said that, if you are already doing all this and still for example, uh, I'm, I'm speaking all the time about male because that's uh, it's only with male that we have that evidence that it's not that super high quality, but at least we, we've seen that it might work for male that have uh, some kind of alterations in the sperm. Uh, and we're seeing that clinical pregnancy rates and birth rates could increase if they are taking antioxidants. 
All right. Again, thank you so much for your question. Of course, your answer to this uh, again with details. So thanks for this. And to well, there is another question. If you could explain, yes, what is the ERA test? Yeah. Hi, Pamela. So the ERA test, uh, it's the endometrial receptivity array test. It's a test in which usually uh, what it's done is um, it's um, with one endometrial preparation, like if you were about to do a frozen entry transfer or you're getting ready for frozen entry transfer or, uh, or to receive the extra one egg donor. And uh, on the day that you will be having the embryo transfer, which means that you have already been taking some estrogens for, for a while and you have a phase of progesterone, uh, we would do a biopsy of the endometrium and that, uh, and that biopsy would be assessed. There are some different tests that would assess only the receptivity. There are other ones that would assess the receptivity, also the macrobiota, and also the, the, immuno, the immunology profile. And with all that information, we can see if there are any alterations. But specifically speaking about receptivity, you know that the window of implantation, it has a very specific time and for a very small population of patients that can be displaced. Uh, and with this test, we could identify the patients that, for example, their window of implantation is a little bit before or a little bit after than what we were considering. Uh, as I mentioned before, maybe in 70-75% of patients who are going to do an endometrial receptivity test will have a normal uh, receptivity, and maybe we're going to be identifying 30 or 25% of patients that might have displaced uh, with the walking foundation and my benefit of having a little bit more days of progesterone or a little bit less, most likely a little bit more days because most of the patients are pre-receptive when they have alterations on the endometrial receptivity test. Okay, yeah. excellent. Thank you. I have added just here because, of course, it's a very similar yeah. question from the patient. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for explaining this to us uh, indeed as well. And uh, well, there is a follow up from Pamela. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to add one more thing. Yes. Regarding the endometrial receptivity test, this is a test that I would not, not recommend to do from the very beginning for a patient who's starting for the first time uh, fertility treatments. I would recommend to do it in the context of someone who has already had several embryo transfers of very good quality blastocysts, hopefully, and better if we have uh, the information if they were chromosomically normal and the, the embryos did not implant, and also in cases in which you know that there are no other problems with the lining, that there's no, I mean, that there's not a, a chronic endometritis or that we don't have a very thin lining that might justify why the embryos are not implanting. That would be the indication for being an endometrial receptivity test. So more than two or three uh, embryo transfers, which in total should be uh, more than four euploid blastocysts that did not implant after having done an endometrial preparation in which we saw like everything was completely normal. That's the context in which we could consider doing that. And even in that context, we're going to find 70% of patients that are going to have a normal result. All right, again, thank you so much for this as well. And there is a follow-up, okay, from uh, from Pamela. So let's have a look. I have had a biopsy, same as you said, with the medication, same as trans transfer, but they didn't call it ERA test. It came back yeah. normal. Yeah, I mean, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of different brands. Uh, ERA test is probably one of the most known ones, but there are other endometrial receptivity tests that have different names. And sometimes, not all the times that we do a biopsy, we're checking for the receptivity. Sometimes we're checking to see if there's an infection. Sometimes we're checking for the immunology. Sometimes we're checking for the microbiota. So, so it is difficult to know exactly if that was the same test or not, Pamela. But it's good that it was normal. All right, exactly. Thank you so much again. Yeah. For this. And then let's have a look. Of course, there is another question. So let's get to it. I have had three frozen embryo transfers with egg donor using assisted hatching. What do you think about assisted hatching? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, as I said, uh, in, in a lot of clinics, uh, assisted hatching is used for patients that are using frozen embryos 
and because there was some data from some small uh, studies saying that when we freeze the embryos, the zona pellucida, which is the shell that protects the embryo, can harden, and maybe in that context it would be beneficial to hatching. Uh, it's not that clear, and as I said, it doesn't look like it increases the life growth rate, so probably it's not necessary, unless the biologists specifically say, look, in that case, in that specific case, the zona is very hard, or there is any kind of other indication, okay? But it has not proven to, to give higher uh, life growth rates. So what I would say is that you need to discuss it specifically with uh, your doctor and your biologists to see was there any any kind of uh, indication in my specific case why assisted hatching was is indicated or why do you think that it might be beneficial and how this is going to impact the, my likelihood of a life work. That's what I would say. Excellent again. Thank you so much for that. And there are like a few questions left, so we will be slowly finishing. However, if you have any questions left, just go ahead and type those in. It will be like a final call for those questions. And the question is right here. Can you take supplements like coenzyme Q10, vitamin E, and fish oil with Chinese medicine? Hi, Ate. Um, Look, I have a lot of patients who take CoQ10, vitamin E, fish oil uh, when they are doing the cycle. As, as explained before, I, I didn't cover CoQ10 uh, and vitamins here. But the CoQ10, uh, it's, an, it's a very potent antioxidant as well, and it has had, it played a very important role in, in uh, heart, uh, in, in what we call cardiac medicine. Uh, it, there are some small studies, very small, with very low quality evidence saying that maybe it can help uh, with the quality, but it's not proven. I don't think that it's going to make any harm to take the, the coquitin or the quinol, but again, it's a treatment that is expensive. Uh, so I, I cannot go against it or anything like this because I don't think that it's going to many harm, but we don't have a proof or a certainty to say that it's going to be beneficial. Vitamin E and fish oil, uh, it really depends on what's your diet and if you have any deficiencies, if you need to take them or not. Usually fish oil, uh, it's beneficial because you will be uh, improving your omega-3 uh, intake, which uh, in some papers has proven to be beneficial for the likelihood of successful outcomes, both for pregnancy in general with natural pregnancy, but also for ART. And uh, with Chinese medicine, this is a very, very wide or very broad term uh, that can, can uh, imply a lot of different uh, Chinese medicines, herbs, and, and I, I don't have the knowledge uh, about Chinese medicine to let you know that. In general, what I would say is that I would not mix that, or if you're going to use some specific Chinese medicine during your cycle, you should be very specific about what you're using and discuss that with your doctor and make sure that this is not going to interfere with the cycle. All right, again, thank you so much for that explanation to all of those. Um, okay, let's have a look. Uh, there are more questions coming up, so let's have a look at this one. What are your thoughts about IMC over ICSI? Yeah, as I, as I mentioned before, um, what I explained um, is that it looks like, even though with IMC, we're looking at that microscope, and we, and we can assess better how are the organelles inside the sperm, uh, it looks like there are no differences in terms of life birth rates. It is true that there are some papers saying that it looks like using IMC might decrease the miscarriage rate, but in terms of at the end having a healthy baby, it didn't, it didn't look like there was an important difference. So I generally think that it's not necessary to to, to do IMC, but obviously again uh, that has to be individualized and, and checked with your with your doctor and see and see why that might be indicated in your case, why that might be useful, and which other benefits would that have in in your treatment. Okay. Thank you again for the explanation to this question as well. And next one is also here. Do you recommend getting an ultrasound of the uterus before going for IVF treatment? This often comes with an AMH test for a female MO 
T? Uh, hi, Mirangela. Yes, I absolutely, I absolutely 100% uh, recommend getting an ultrasound, the uterus and the ovaries and an EMH before an IVF treatment. In fact, those are two of the mandatory tests that I request to all of my patients. And I am pretty sure that if not all, the vast majority of other doctors that are also giving webinars in that platform or that are working in most of the places would recommend you to do that. This is like the basic information that we need to decide which is the best treatment protocol to give you, which is your ovarian reserve. Uh, also to assess if your uterus is normal, if we see any suspicion of polyps, fibroids, uh, any kind of uterine malformation, where are the ovaries located? If, is it, if it's going to be easy to access the ovaries when we're going to do the egg collection. So we get a lot of very important information with, uh, with both the ultrasound and the AMH. So absolutely, yes. All right, excellent. Again, thank you so much for your question and, of course, your explanation to that. And next question is, my next frozen embryo transfer is at the end of July. I have to take dexamethasone on my CD1. What does dexamethasone uh, actually do? Yeah, so the dexamethasone is a corticosteroid, and this is also something used a lot of times for patients who have had recurrent implantation failure or several miscarriages to try to balance the immune system and try to, to have the implantation. Perfect, once again, and there are like uh, two questions left. So let's get to this one. With all the add-ons available, it's confusing the best ones to go for. Are add-ons really necessary, needed, and does age have an impact play a factor? Hi, Emma, that's a very interesting question. So first of all, uh, age, when we're speaking about IVF with your own ex, uh, age is probably the most important factor that's going to determine your, the likelihood that you have a successful outcome. So yes, it, yes indeed, it plays a role uh, and it's a, a very important factor to take in consideration. And then uh, the second thing, I hope you understand that it's confusing to, to know which are the best add-ons to, to go for and if they are necessary or not. And again, what I would suggest is that you take the, the, those questions that I explained at the very end of the presentation and that you ask your doctor, which of those add-ons are going to make a difference on my likelihood of a life worth? Because at the end of the story, this is what is important. And then you discuss because obviously, as I said before, we can do a general recommendation for the add-ons. There are some patients that might benefit of some specific things. There are patients that um, there's not going to be any kind of difference at all if they use any, any add-ons or not. So uh, it's important uh, to individualize and tailor each treatment to the needs of each couple or patient. And excellent. Thank you so much once again for that. And well, it seems that this is our last question. So let's get to it. Is there a on natural cycle better than on stimulated or not? So, hi, Julia. The important thing is that the edit test is done in the exact same circumstances that your actual embryo transfer is going to take place. So, if you're going to do your embryo transfer with a natural cycle, then you have to do the ERA on a natural cycle. If your embryo transfer is going to be under a stimulated cycle, you have to do it under a stimulated cycle. Having said that, usually it's a little bit easier to have more control on the cycle when we do a stimulated one, but both options are, uh, are available and it has to be discussed with your consultant which which of those is the one that uh, would be better in your specific case and excellent again thank you so much and actually one more just showed right here so let me show you is max helpful yeah um with max it's a little bit the same as uh the other techniques that i explained for for uh, choosing better the the sperm it doesn't look like there are any, we don't have any specific data saying that this would increase the life birth rate. So in that sense, that, that's all I can say. Charlotte. 
All right, excellent. Again, thank you so much. And yes, it seems that that was our last question for today. So thank you everyone for joining us, for your questions. And of course, Dr. Maria, as always, for your expertise. It's always good to have you with us. And I just want to mention that if you would like to get some uh, more answers, have some more questions, you can also use the link I have just sent to you. There was an option to ask your question. It will be forwarded to Dr. Maria and her team. And I'm sure they will be happy to help you, but also there you can find some more webinars from Dr. Maria. And as you know, there will be plenty of interesting um, webinars there as well. And we will be finishing for today, but Dr. Maria, is there anything you would like to add? Um, first of all, thank you all for attending and for listening. Uh, and then I hope that you found the information useful. And for me, the, the take home message is that add-ons are not always necessary and that I, for me it's very important to empower patients and that patients can make informed decisions and if they decide, if they decide to, to use one of those add-ons that they, they know exactly what to expect out of it and, and that they know which is the evidence that we have for using it and because otherwise mm, I mean if then the outcome of the cycle is not what they expect I think it's important they felt that they had all the information before when they were deciding what, what to do. So that's 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 a big message, just to try to be as well informed as possible and ask all your questions to your doctor before embarking to the treatment to make sure that you understand everything properly and that you feel like you're in safe and good hands. And perfect. Thank you so much. That is exactly what uh, you should be doing. Ask lots of questions. <laughs> Thank you so, so much again for that. And I just want to mention that this has been re recorded. So, of course, you will have a chance to watch this again. You will be able to find it on myivfanses.com. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will be notified when the new video is uploaded, of course. And also all the previous webinars can be found with the link I have just sent to you. And I just want to mention that that uh, there is another webinar coming up at uh, 8 p.m. UK time. So I do hope to see you there as well. And uh, well, to everyone else, thank you so much for joining Dr. Maria as well. Thank you once more. It's always, always a pleasure. And I know there will be plenty more coming up. So uh, looking forward to it already. Have a relaxing weekend, everyone. And goodbye. Thanks, Caroline. Good to be with you as well. And uh, yeah, we will see each other soon, I guess. Bye-bye. Exactly. Thank you. Bye. Bye.